Okay, in this video, we're going to analyze the effects of immigration and of foreign direct investment using two of the models we developed earlier in the course. So for our short-run analysis, we're going to use the specific factors model. Now remember, we consider that model to be a short-run model because of the fact that we have factors of production. And in the model, we, the way we set it up in, in class, we had it that capital was specific to manufacturing and land was specific to agriculture. And so you could take an example, uh, that, you know, think of that as a short-run model because of the fact that the factors aren't all freely mobile. The hectoral lin model, on the other hand, we think of that as a long-run model because all of the factors of production are mobile. So that's why we're going to use those two models to respectively do our short-run and long-run analysis. So we'll start off by looking at immigration. So how are we going to go about trying to, to look at the effects of immigration in the domestic economy in the short run? Well, if you think back to that specific factors model, the way we had it set up, we assumed that labor was the mobile factor. And we can continue with that assumption for now. Now remember, the, the way we set up these models, uh, you know, especially in specific factors, which factor we decide is going to be the mobile factor, and which factors are going to be specific to the, the two industries, we can change those around depending on exactly what kinds of questions we want to address. And so I encourage you, as, we, as I work through these analyses here, to think about, well, what if we wanted to look at something like wage inequality? Right? So here we're going to only be talking about one kind of homogeneous labor. But what if we wanted to take a look at how immigration might impact wage inequality? How would we have to change the setup to the model compared to what we're going to do here in order to address that question? If you remember, we had introduced this new graph, or at least what was new when we started talking about the specific factors model. And what was, what was the graph that we had here? Remember, we had this graph where we showed the allocation of labor. Right? So our x-axis shows all of the labor in the economy. And we had two origins here, one for say, agriculture, and one for manufacturing. Yeah. And so we read the graph for agriculture as normal from left to right, but the graph for manufacturing, well, that, that's reversed on us. right? And so whatever, wherever we show our equilibrium, right, so that's what's going to show us the allocation of labor across the two sectors. Remember, this is the value of the marginal product of labor in agriculture, which is the price of agricultural goods times the marginal product of labor. And likewise, but read in the opposite direction, we have the value of the marginal product of labor in manufacturing. The intersection of the two curves, that's where the value of the marginal product of the last worker in each sector is equal, meaning that's where wages are going to be equal in the two sectors. And that's what we need for equilibrium in this market where we've got free mobility of identical workers. So we just start from this point here. You know, we take this as this is our, our equilibrium to start with. Now, how would we show an influx of workers into this economy in our model? Well, so bear in mind here, this x-axis here is giving us the total labor supply. Now, when we set up the specific factors model, we assumed that the quantities of labor, capital, and land were fixed. Well, now we're changing that around. Right? We're going to allow for an increase in the amount of labor through immigration. So how could we incorporate that? Well, if we have an increase in the number of workers, that's going to be illustrated through stretching out or expanding our x-axis here. And now it's important to understand and to recognize that it doesn't matter which axis we shift. You'll get the same answers. Right? So you just pick one and you, and you go with it. So because of the, the space here, the way I've, I've drawn this on, on the light board, 
I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stretch or you know expand the the graph on the right hand side so on the manufacturing origin so you can imagine that an increase in immigration would be like expanding this graph say by this much right? so now we're moving our origin for manufacturing out to here well so what does that mean well remember this is the value of the marginal product of labor which is determined by the price of manufactured goods which we're assuming is given on the world market okay making again that sort of small country assumption where it doesn't matter what this country that we're analyzing is going to do how much it increases or decreases its production of manufactured goods it won't impact the world price so the price doesn't change and the marginal product of labor well that that's a function of technology and we're holding technology constant as well remember we are trying to isolate the effect of one event or one change on what's going to happen in the economy right so if we're going to look at an influx of workers and immigration we want to keep everything else the same right? it's our ceteris paribus condition so what does that mean well remember this value of the marginal product of labor curve for manufacturing that's relative to the y-axis here so when we stretch that graph out we've got to pull the value of the marginal product of labor curve with it okay? so I think we'd be doing something like I had about that much of a gap so let's say we do something like this okay? you don't have to be exact this is just for illustration So what do we see now? Well, now we'll see that the intersection between our two value of the marginal product of labor curves is here with a new lower wage and an increase in the amount of labor that's in agriculture. Right? That, that part should be really easy to see right away. You remember, the quantity of labor that's employed in agriculture starts off, right, we read it from left to right. So initially, it's from OA to L. Right, we had this much. But now, we have this much labor employed in agriculture. So does that mean that we have fewer workers employed in manufacturing? So this one's not as easy to see right away. You have to do a little bit more work. Well, what we want to focus on here, an easy way to see this is to remember that we shifted our, our curve for the manufacturing sector by the amount of labor that we added. Right? Think about this as a parallel shift to the right. So that the total amount of labor that we brought into into our economy should be reflected here. Right? It should be the same as, as this amount here. Of course, I don't always draw things exact. I'm not an artist. So if you look at it, we increased the amount of labor in agriculture from L star to L prime. But the total change or increase in the labor supply due to immigration is due to this amount, right? is this amount right here. So what does that mean? Because out of the total influx or the increase in the labor supply due to immigration, these workers went into agriculture and the rest went into manufacturing. Okay. Right. Labor is employed in both sectors. So in the end, we would expect workers to funnel into both industries. So we can also illustrate this in our PPF to show what would happen to, to output as well. And so if we're looking at this here, Right here we've got, uh, and we'll put manufacturing on the x-axis, agriculture on the y. So here, here's our, our PPF. And for now, you know, we could just assume, uh, you know, assume that we're not opening up to trade, closed economy. The only thing we have is, is migration of labor. So if if this represents our world price line, right, our price line, 
Now, what would happen to the PPF? Well, in this case, it makes sense to think that the influx of labor won't necessarily impact one industry more than another, right? Because we have labor as being the mobile factor. So we shift our PPF outward you know, about equally for both, for both industries. And we might expect, right, expect to ha see something like this so that our, our production moves in this direction. So what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing an increase in production for both agriculture and for manufacturing. Okay. Now again, we're getting this result in large part because we've set up labor to be the mobile factor. What would happen if instead we had labor being specific to one industry or to change it up and make it really interesting, what if we have two types of workers, skilled and unskilled workers, where we have skilled workers being specific, say, to a high-tech sector, and less skilled workers being, uh, say, in a service, uh, low-skilled service sector, right, specific to that sector, with capital being freely mobile between the two? Then how might that analysis change? Then we'd have to determine, well, what types of workers are coming in. And then we can get a very uh, much, much richer set of, of analyses and predictions in terms of how labor markets will be impacted by immigration. But if we stick for just one more moment with this short run analysis for the specific factors model where there's only one kind of, of, of worker and the workers are mobile, what do we see here clearly? So the first thing that's very you know, easy to see is that wages drop. Right? And so what's, what's going on here? Well, the way we've set up the model, the immigrants are directly competing. Right? They're directly competing with the domestic or the, you know, what you could call them the native workers. Right? And so that's putting downward pressure on wages. Right? That's a big assumption. Right? And it's an important assumption. So when we talk about some of the empirical studies and the analyses trying to estimate the effects of immigration on native workers, we're going to have to, to really think hard about whether that assumption holds and under what conditions. Okay. But for this simple analysis, that's the assumption that's being made. And if that's the case, clearly we can see there's downward pressure. Now, another important thing to note about this model is that we don't have any unemployment. Right? The wage adjusts so that everybody remains fully employed. Right? Now, in reality, if you have any kind of wage rigidities, right, if wages aren't freely flexible, or if we were to introduce any kind of sector or you know, industry or occupational specific human capital, uh, we might see some kind of unemployment arise from that, uh, especially if, if it's uh, something that you know, there's a barrier to entering the other occupation. But we've, we've abstracted away from all of that. Okay? But in reality, it, you know, not everything, not all of the movement all of the impact on the native workers will necessarily be along the, the lines of wages. Right? It could also be in terms of lower rates of employment as well. So that's our short run analysis. What about in the long run? Okay, so in the long run, we're going to use the, the Hexer-Lin model. There we only have two factors, right? we'll have labor and capital. And if we're doing our, our long run analysis, you know, again, we, we have to make some, some assumptions. Right? So we're going to assume that manufacturing sector is our <clears throat> capital intensive sector, right? So if we assume that manufacturing is capital intensive, so what does that mean? Well, that means that the labor to capital ratio is higher in agriculture. It's the same thing as, as saying that the capital to labor ratio is higher in manufacturing, right? Just two different ways of thinking about the same sets of inequalities, okay? So we're going to assume that manufacturing is capital intensive. So what does that mean for us in the short run, okay? or in the long run, rather? So here, we have to introduce. Uh, a new graph. 
Okay? It's a good thing is that we're, we're keeping this down to one new graph introduced per, per chapter. So if you think about it, when we, when we did the Hexer-Lin model, we just kind of stuck with our, uh, most, mostly we stuck with our PPF, and then we, we had a, a graph that, that showed us uh, it was a relative supply and relative demand for labor and capital to look at what happens to the wage to rental rate ratio. But the important thing for this analysis is that we're going to have the price, again, of the outputs staying constant. So now we're going to need, uh, need a different, uh, different model to look at here because we're going to have prices staying the same and we're going to have technology, again, staying the same, right? No change in price or marginal product of labor, either in manufacturing or in agriculture. Right? So what does, that, well, what does that mean for us? Well, if we're not changing any of those, those kind of foundational, those, those, those basic pieces for the demand for, for labor, right? at least you know, if we're, we're holding the, the initial allocation of labor and capital the same, uh, then that would mean no change for wages. Right? So how are we going to how are we going to analyze this? So here we're introducing what we call the the box diagram. So much like what we did with this diagram here, really what we're doing is we're taking two graphs and we're going to end up flipping one so that we can put the two together. Right? And just to kind of be consistent with how we set this up uh, for for you guys or well. So what I'll do is be consistent there. I'll, I'll put agriculture on this origin here. You can imagine here we've got Got this graph for agriculture. Okay. <clears throat> so here what we're looking at, and up here we'll put, put manufacturing. Okay. Well, what do we have here? So here we have, what we're, we're going to show is, so we've got labor on our x-axis, right? We actually have two x-axis here, right? And now we've got capital on our y-axis, okay? We're measuring the amount of labor in agriculture from left to right and from the bottom up. And we're measuring the amount of labor in manufacturing from right to left and from top down, right? So it's like we took this took the graph for manufacturing, and instead of just flipping it backwards, we've actually flipped it in reverse, so backwards and upside down. Right? And what we're going to draw here is we're going to draw a line through the origin where that slope is giving us the capital to labor ratio for agriculture. And so we're going to draw that relatively flat because we want to really, really show very clearly that agriculture has a lower capital to labor ratio than manufacturing. So we draw that one pretty flat. And we're going to do the same thing for manufacturing, except we're reading that, right, that slope as from this side rather than from the bottom up. So a right, much steeper line for manufacturing intersection of the two gives us the allocation of labor and capital in the society. Okay. So now what are we going to do here to show the influx of labor? Well, we've got to do the same thing that we did in the short run, right? We have to somehow put this into our graph. And we're going to do it in a similar fashion where we're going to stretch out or expand our graph along our x-axis. And just as we did before, if we're going to be consistent, that means we've also got to bring our curve for manufacturing along with it. So I'm going to extend this line so that we can make sure to find where they intersect. And now note, I haven't changed any of the underlying technology, right? So remember, th these capital to labor ratios, if you think back to our analysis in the hexer lin model, the capital to labor ratio employed in any industry is a function of two things, technology, which we're not changing, and the wage to rental rate ratio. 
So what we're actually going to be showing here is that you can get this influx of labor, right? this increased supply of labor fully employed in the economy without affecting the wage to rental rate ratio. So what does that mean? Well, if the wage to rental rate ratio isn't changing and technology is not changing, that means that the capital to labor ratio for each sector has to stay the same. Because right? those are the two, two main components that are affecting those, that, that ratio for each sector, right? capital to labor ratio. So that means that the slope of this curve for manufacturing, as we bring it out, is staying the same. Right? It's going to continue to remain being the capital intensive sector. So now what are, we, what are we seeing here? Well, now our intersection is, is out here. Right? So what's happened? And if we extend this just to really make it clear for everyone, it's our initial K. So what's happening? In this case, we've got this big increase in the amount of labor that's employed in agriculture. And in fact, that increase is larger than the increase we had, that would have been up to here, right, for the, the influx of labor. Right? So the increase in the amount of, of labor employed is there. We, we can also see that by looking at how much labor is employed. In, right? And now we have this much labor here employed in manufacturing, right? whereas before we had a larger amount. And very clear, very easy to see that we have less capital employed in manufacturing. Right? So what does that mean? Well, that means we're taking resources out of manufacturing, right? That's, which is what? It's the capital intensive sector. So an increase in the amount of labor causes an expansion of the agricultural sector at the expense of the manufacturing sector. So how can we see that in our, in our PPF? Okay, so remember, this one was our short run analysis here, right? So that was our short run analysis. Let's put our other PPF right on top of it so that you can see them right next to each other. So again, I'll keep agriculture up here and manufacturing here. So what's the difference? Well, now if we start off initially with this PPF and say, initial production here. Now, when we allow for this influx to labor, in using this Hexer-Olin analysis, well, that increase in labor is going to expand potential production in agriculture by a lot more than in manufacturing, because agriculture is the labor-intensive sector. So we get something like this. Right, so if you look at any, any level of output for manufacturing, our new PPF is a lot steeper. So if we're going to keep prices the same, if we're going to have the same slope, the international price line here, if we're going to do that, in order to find the PPF having that same slope, it's going to be somewhere, say, up here. And what does that mean for us? Well, that means that output in manufacturing has to decrease, while output in agriculture increases. Okay. So this is a very important uh, insight when we're looking at the effect of an influx of of labor in the long run, using this Hexer-Olin model, what the Hexer-Olin model predicts is that we can incorporate that influx of labor without changing the wage to rental rate. Okay. Instead, what's going to happen is that the labor-intensive industry is going to expand, and the capital-intensive industry is going to contract. And that's what allows us to incorporate the influx of labor without having to affect the wage to rental rate. Sometimes here, I think, uh, again, I like using these numerical examples just to help illustrate uh, what's happening here. So 
let's say that in order to produce one unit of manufactured goods, you're going to need one worker and four machines. But in agriculture, you would need, say, two and two. Right. So how, how are you going to end up incorporating an influx of workers? Okay. So let's say that I get four more workers. Right. So if change in L is four. Well, I could put all those workers into agriculture. Right. But if I put four, four more workers into agriculture, so I'll increase agricultural output by two units, in order to do that, well, I have to also bring in four units of capital. But if I take those four units of, of capital out, then I'd also have one more freed up worker, right? So eventually we have to keep, right, kind of keep scaling that up eventually to get everybody um, worked in here. Now, again, this is a really basic model. We're ignoring costs for workers to shift from one sector to another. We're assuming that capital is, is perfectly mobile. So, uh, and that's... You know, that's a very long-run assumption, right? Or maybe if you're thinking about financial capital. But machines can't just be broken down without cost and then repurposed to work in a totally different industry. Yeah. So the truth is potentially going to lie somewhere in between our long and short-run analysis. Right? Our short-run analysis said that this influx of workers, right, these immigrants, if they're competing with the, the native workers, will push wages down. The long-run analysis from the Hechtel-Lin model says that doesn't have to happen. What can happen instead is that the labor-intensive sector expands, the capital-intensive sector shrinks, so we can absorb all that, that immigrant labor without affecting wages. Well, maybe it's a bit of both. Right? You can think about it that way. Uh, ultimately, like everything else, it's an empirical question, and we'll talk about that in class. Next, we're going to do an analysis, again, starting short run and then moving to the long run for an influx of capital through foreign direct investment. So now we're going to turn to an analysis of foreign direct investment, right, which is an increase in the capital stock. What do we mean by foreign direct investment? Well, we're not just talking about like, if you go out and you purchase some stock in a foreign company. And that's called foreign portfolio investment. It's not foreign direct investment. So the, the standard threshold that's used is if a foreign entity takes at least a 10% ownership stake in a company in another country, that would, that's over that threshold for, to be considered foreign direct investment. Why that 10% number? Well, somewhat arbitrary, but at the same time, it represents uh, at least what economists view as a sufficient level of investment in the company, a big enough stake that they may now have incentive to get involved with managerial decisions, affect technology transfer, things like that. What we're going to focus on here is what's referred to as greenfield investment. So that would be setting up completely you know, brand new facilities. Okay, so really talking about an influx of physical capital, right? not just buying stock in an existing company in another country. And as you can imagine, setting up a new plant with all the machines that will go in it, that kind of thing. That's what we're, we're really going to be focusing on here. Okay. So just like we did for, for our analysis of, it, of immigration, we're going to do a short run and then a long run analysis. So we're going to be using the same tools, the same graphs, as we did before. I'll go a little bit more quickly here, since I'm not introducing anything new at this point. There are graphs that we've worked with already. So once again, short-run analysis, we're going to use that specific factors model. Uh, and here now, we're going to take, uh, say, we're going to have two sectors, and we'll have the IT sector. Right. I think in the book they use computers. Let's broaden that a little bit. So here's the IT sector, and here is the apparel sector, and so clothing. Okay, uh, and 
well, I don't know, let's say that uh, it's going to be for the short run analysis a little, a little silly, uh, but let's say that land is specific to apparel for, for growing the, the cotton for the, for the clothing, and that capital is specific to the IT sector, and labor, once again, is going to be the mobile factor, okay? just as we had before. So here we're going to have the value of the marginal product curve for labor in apparel. And here is our value of the marginal product of labor curve for IT. Equilibrium wage and allocation of labor across the two sectors. Now before, when we looked at how to, how to show an influx of, of labor, we had to stretch out or expand this graph because the quantity of labor, right, the total supply of labor in the economy is measured by the width of that x-axis. Now we're in this graph where that x-axis, again, is still measuring the quantity of labor, but now it's capital that's changing. So how would we reflect that? Well, if capital is specific to the IT sector, then it's only going to impact the IT sector. So what we would see here is an increase in the marginal product of labor in the IT sector. Why is that? Well, for any given allocation of labor, and for any given quantity of labor employed in the IT sector, you're increasing the amount of capital that's available so that the capital to labor ratio has increased. And so if we just say starting at, at L star, and remember, the marginal product of labor is an increasing function, right? Or it's positively affected by the capital to labor ratio. Add more capital into the economy, you're going to raise the marginal productivity of labor, but only in manufacturing, or IT rather, because capital, as we've set up this, this model, is specific to IT. So we shift the curve for the IT sector up. <clears throat> Wages increase, and labor shifts out of apparel, right? Moving the labor this way, shifts out of apparel and into IT. Right. Very important thing to note here, because a lot of the times when people are, are, are working with these models for the first time, they get tripped up, and they say, oh, well, look, wages went up in the IT sector. Remember, wages have to be equal between the two sectors because of the free mobility of labor. All right, that's simplifying assumption in our specific factors model. So this means that the wage is going up in both sectors. Okay, so it's very important. Take a moment to think about that. We're saying that an influx of capital, which is only employed in the IT sector, actually leads to an increase in wages for workers in the apparel sector. How could that be? It's because of this movement of labor. Uh, what we end up doing, right, we haven't shifted this curve at right, the marginal product of labor times the price uh, in, a, in apparel times the price of apparel, right? The value of the marginal product of labor in apparel, we haven't shifted that curve. But we have decreased the amount of labor employed in apparel. So really what we've done is we're moving up our curve here. Because right? as we take labor out, so that the value of the marginal product produced by the last worker in apparel is higher after the influx of capital than it was before. Another way to, to look at that is as you take workers out of apparel and put them into IT, you now have fewer workers you working with the same amount of land, right? That same amount of terrain. So that T over L ratio has actually gone up means that at the margin, the marginal product of labor in IT, or in apparel rather, will be higher. Okay. It's a very important insight that we have from this model. The influx of capital, even though in the short run it's only employed in IT, actually leads to higher wages for workers in both sectors. So that's our, our basic short run analysis, and we can, we can show this in our PPF in the following way. Right, so if I put 
IT down here. And I put apparel up here. And start off with, say, some initial production here, given our prices. And my initial quantity of IT, initial quantity of apparel. So what happens when we have that influx of capital? Well, that doesn't increase production possibilities in apparel at all. Right? Capital's not employed there. So we actually don't change that point there on our PPF. Right? That intercept with the apparel axis stays the same. So we're only shifting out the intercept on the IT axis. So keeping prices the same You'd expect, right, keeping that slope the same, that we end up somewhere say, out here. And so production in apparel declines. And production in IT expands. So I'm clear, it has to be the case, right? The way we've drawn uh, our graph, the allocation of labor graph up here, we have a fixed amount of land, and we're taking labor out of apparel, so that's going to necessarily lower total production in apparel. And so that's our, our short run analysis. It's a pretty pretty basic uh, idea here: is that we're going to get an expansion of output in the industry or capital is specific to that industry, and a contraction of the other industry. The other really important insight is that the mobile factor gains. Okay? The return to the mobile factor has gone up. Now, what about the return to capital and the return to land? Well, we know that T over L has gone up. Right? And so here what we're thinking about, remember, the rental rate on capital is equal to the price of IT goods, right? because it's specific to IT, times the marginal product of capital in IT. Right? Well, in this model, we're holding, this ex in these examples, is what we're doing is we're holding prices constant. Right? No change in the price. So the question then becomes, well, what happens to the marginal product of capital? Likewise, for land, I mean, the price of apparel times the marginal product of land in apparel. Well, we know that the marginal product of land is a function of the labor to land, or terrain ratio, just like the marginal product of capital is a function of the L to K ratio. right? Well, what's, what's actually happening here? This one, right, for land, should be pretty straightforward to see. What's happening in this case? In this case, the, the marginal product of land has to be falling because we've taken labor out of apparel production, right? And land is specific to apparel. We've got a fixed amount of land, and we're taking labor out, so that means the marginal product of land is falling, so the rental rate is also going to fall. Now, for capital, it's a little bit trickier. Right? It's maybe not as obvious at a first glance, because we've increased the amount of capital that we have in our society. But at the same time, we've increased the amount of labor that we're putting into the IT sector. So then the question is, well, which one is, is larger? Right? How can we see that? Well, we go back to our, our graph over here. What happened to the wage? In equilibrium, what happened to the wage? So if you think about this, the wage has gone up in both sectors, right? In IT and in apparel. But right now we're going to focus on, on IT. And if the wage went up in the IT sector, 
how could that be the case? If we haven't changed technology and we're not changing the price of, I, you know, of the goods, or the price of IT or the price of, of, of apparel, well, then the only way, that, the only way we could get the, pr the wage to go up would be for the marginal product of labor to increase through a change in the capital to labor ratio. So the only way the wage goes up is if in the end you end up having a larger increase in the capital supply than you do shift of labor into IT. So that overall, the labor to capital ratio actually goes down, right? Or in other words, the capital to labor ratio goes up. So that means that the return to capital goes down. So the return to the mobile factor goes up, right, to labor in this case. The return to both specific factors goes down. You could do this instead of uh, having an increase in capital, you could have an increase in land or a decrease in land. Um, you know, maybe natural disaster uh, reduces the amount of arable land and we're talking about agricultural output, uh, something like that. Okay? <clears throat> and you'll see very similar patterns here. So that's our, our short run analysis. Now, if we're taking a look at the, <coughs> the long run analysis, so we're gonna go back to our box diagram. Okay, so there was our short run, now I'm gonna do our long run. So short run over here, long run over here. So now let's, let's go back to our box diagram and I'll put apparel down here. Here's gonna be our origin for capital or for uh, IT, but let me put it up here because what we're gonna end up doing is stretching or expanding our graph on the, the capital axes, so. So, uh, and again, let's, uh, <clears throat> we assumed that IT, uh, capital was specific to IT in the short run. So let's continue along with this, uh, that general theme, and we're gonna assume that IT is the capital intensive sector, and that apparel is the labor intensive sector, okay? Remember, long run analysis, we're going back to a Heckscher in model, two inputs, labor and capital. So when we've got, now with our assumptions here, how do we illustrate that? Well, just like before, we'll have a very flat line for apparel, much steeper one for IT. All right, so there's our initial allocation of labor and capital in the model. So what are we showing here? We've got a lot of labor, but relatively little capital employed in apparel a lot of capital, relatively little labor uh, employed in IT. And, and I'm drawing these somewhat exaggerated just because it's a lot easier to, to, to illustrate what's going on. So what happens now if we increase the capital supply? Well, remember, when we did the analysis for immigration, we expanded our labor axis. So we're gonna do the same thing now, but for capital. And so capital is on the y-axis, so we're going to shift our curve, our, or stretch our whole graph up like this. And remember, you've got to take this curve for capital, and it's got to move with its origin, and I'm going to keep the same slope. So now we would end up, say, at a point like this. Okay? So what's happening? the amount of labor in, and capital employed in apparel has decreased. All right, we're taking those resources out of apparel and putting them into IT. All right, so not only is the IT sector absorbing all of the, the capital, right, all of that foreign direct investment, it's also taking some capital out of apparel. And in order to expand, it's also gonna have to take some labor out of apparel as well. And so we end up with this kind of scenario, right? So similar analysis to what we did for uh, labor, immigration, in the long run. And, and what, do you, what do we note ha is happening here, right? So if we, we draw our PPF, and we'll put, again, put IT to be consistent with what we did before on the x-axis, and 
apparel on the y-axis. At, at initial prices, or well, at prices that aren't, which aren't going to change. This is our initial levels of production of IT and apparel. So what happens to our PPF? Well, in this case, it's not as extreme as in the short run model. Right? In the short run model, capital was only employed in IT, so we only changed the X or the IT intercept for our PPF. Well, in the long run, labor and capital are both employed in apparel and in IT. So we're going to increase, right, we're going to shift out our PPF on both axes. We're just going to do so much more for our capital intensive good, right, for IT. And so again, as we have before, what you'd expect to see is something like this, right? A shift out in our production for IT, because it's the capital intensive good, and a decrease in production for, in, uh, for our labor intensive good apparel. So we've seen this twice now, right? When we talked about immigration, we said in the long run, an influx of workers, right, immigrants, will increase production of the labor-intensive industry and decrease production of the capital-intensive industry. Now we flip that around. We've had an influx of capital. So that influx of capital, right, that foreign direct investment, is going to lead to an expansion of the capital-intensive industry and a contraction of the labor-intensive industry. We refer to this general prediction as the Rybshinsky theorem. Right. I'll say that one more time because it's you know people struggle to, to kind of fully grasp this idea. Right, the Rybshinsky theorem states that when you have an increase in one of the factors of production in the long run the industry that intensively uses that factor of production will expand, and the other sector or sectors will contract. Yeah, that's our Rybshinsky theorem. So that's, that's the gist of how you, we use specific factors to analyze foreign direct investment inflows in the short run, and the heckscher lin model to analyze the effect of those flows in the long run. And again, we go back to, um, right, just to reiterate, in this long run analysis, right, the Heckscher Lin model, we're assuming there's no change in input prices, okay? that the wage and the rental rate stays the same, and that we are able to incorporate this increase in the, the factor of production, in this case capital, by shifting resources around so that we have an expansion of the capital intensive sector and a contraction of the labor intensive sector. So the last thing that's left for us to do in this chapter Let's just briefly illustrate how immigration and capital flows lead to worldwide increases in, in total output. Right, so as a final exercise, or actually a set of exercises uh, in this for this chapter, we're going to illustrate the gains from immigration and the gains from foreign direct investment. So I'll start off with immigration. Here we're going to use a familiar graph, but we're actually going to recast it so that instead of looking at this allocation of labor across two sectors, we're going to look at the allocation of labor across two countries. Okay. And so on the left here, we'll have the home country. And on the right, we will have the foreign country. Okay. And so instead of our x-axis measuring the total labor supply in the economy or you know, a country, it's the total worldwide labor supply. 
And again, we're making this simplifying assumption. There's only one kind of labor. All the workers are homogeneous. We start off with right, our two curves. So just as before, this is the value of the marginal product of labor. But instead of for an industry, it's the value of the marginal product of labor in home and the value of the marginal product of labor in foreign, <clears throat> right? which of course in equilibrium will give us the wage in home and foreign in our competitive labor markets. So what we're going to do here, though, is we're going to start off with a world where labor is not mobile. So we're going to have an initial allocation of labor. And what we're going to assume is that the initial allocation of labor is such that the wage will be higher in the home country than in foreign. Right, so if this is the initial allocation of labor, L0, between the two countries, right, well, that fixed labor supply or allocation of labor intersects the foreign country's wage curve, right, or their demand curve here. So that would be the wage in the foreign country. And this would be the wage in the home country. Now, wages are higher in the home country, so that if we were to allow workers to migrate, clearly they would want to migrate from foreign to home. Now, we're going to make another simplifying assumption here just to, to make it a lot easier to, to work with the graph. And we're going to assume that there is no cost to migration, which is clearly not a realistic assumption. Right? We know that there are significant migration costs. And uh, it, it's worth taking a bit of time to think about what those migration costs are. Right? Clearly, there are out-of-pocket costs. Right? If anyone has gone through uh, immigration, the legal immigration process here, H-1B, or uh, you know, any other process to get you know, permanent residency and citizenship, it takes a lot of time, and it costs a lot of money. Uh, so you have that out-of-pocket cost. You also have the psychological costs that are involved with immigration. Right? leaving loved ones behind, leaving everything you know, the city where you grew up, your culture, and moving to, to a different country. All of that gets factored into the cost of migration. For now, we're going to abstract away from that. So without any migration costs, what's going to happen? Well, workers will start leaving foreign and going to home until wages equate. And that happens at L1. All right, so wages would equate equal to L to W star. So how can we show the gains globally? All right, this is worldwide. How do we show gains from trade? Well, if you look at it, let's focus on this area between L0 and L1. What's happening here? Start with the value of the marginal product of labor curve in the home country. So we're taking these workers, between L0 and L1, we're taking them out of foreign, or they're taking themselves out of the foreign country and moving to home. So they're going from being productive, being you know, working in foreign. So you think about that first person that we move right there at L0. The value of their efforts in the foreign country were equal to WF. The value when we move that worker up to the home country is up at WH. And we've increased, by, by having that worker move from foreign to home, we've increased the total value of what's produced by that amount. Okay. It's the same thing with every single worker. If I were to take another one and call that, you know, say the L prime, at that point, when we take that worker or that worker moves from foreign, we're losing output valued up here, but we're gaining output worth this much. Right? They're more productive in the home country. So what does this triangle here represent for us? This triangular area, I drew them kind of as curves here, but these were straight lines rather than curves. That triangle there would represent the gains, the global gains from immigration. Right? 
And what is that really reflecting? It's it reflecting the increase in the total global value of production when these workers move from where they are less productive, the foreign country, to where they are more productive, the home country. Now, it's not the end of the story, of course, because there are other distributional effects that are taking place. Right? You have all of these workers from OH to L, L0. Right? These are the workers who are already in the home country. Well, initially, they were getting paid wages of WH. Now they're only making W star. So the home country, right, those native workers, as we referred to them before, they're losing this. I'll shade this area in for us here, right, that rectangle. Right? They're losing that, but it's not a loss to the economy because it's actually a transfer from the native workers to the firms. Right? It's a shift from one group to another. So it's a redistribution of surplus, but it's not a net change in the total surplus, right? or inefficiency loss or, or gain either way. But this triangle here does reflect an overall net gain just by having workers move from where they are less to where they are more productive. We can do the same thing for foreign direct investment. Right? If we want to take a look at the same thing now, except here, instead of having our graph showing us the, the x-axis being labor, we're just going to, again, kind of recast this and have it be capital. So the gains from FDI, we would show in the same way. But as I just said, instead of labor, now we've got the allocation of global capital on the x-axis, home country here, foreign country here, and now this is the value of the marginal product of capital. in home and in foreign. Here is the global rental rate, or what would be the in equilibrium, right? This is what should be the equilibrium allocation. But again, we're going to start off with a case where um, you've got, right, we don't have the efficient allocation of, of capital. And so in this case, uh, to be consistent, just uh, with the example that, that's in your textbook, let's say that initially the allocation of labor is, uh, of capital is here. Right. And so what's true in this case, so we have a lot of capital in the home country, right, such that initially the rental rate in home would be here, and the rental rate and foreign would be up here. Well, so what does that mean? That means the owners of capital would like to take, take that ca some of their capital and move it from home to foreign, right, where it will be more productive and gain a higher return. So if we were to remove capital controls and allow for movement of capital from home to foreign, right, we'd end up shifting from K0 right, to K star. All of this capital would move from home to foreign. We end up here. And just as we had with, with labor, this triangle here represents the gains from our capital flows. And once again, why is that? Well, it's because we're moving capital from where it has a low marginal productivity or value of marginal product to where it has a higher value of marginal product. Another way, again, another way to think about this is this triangle, or this the actually rectangle plus triangle, this area underneath the curve for the home country, and I'm shading in, or actually outlining here, this area, that represents the lost value of output in the home country when capital leaves and moves to foreign. Right? It's the area under the curve for the home country between K0 and K star, right, which is the, the capital that, that moved from home to foreign. But while we lose this much output that was being produced in home, we gain 
this much output. Right? It's this larger outlined area. Right? So we lose this, but we gain the area under the curve for the foreign country. And what's the difference? The difference is that triangle in between. Okay? Again, overall gains, but there are distributional considerations. Right? The owners of capital in the home country are happy to be getting a higher return for their ownership of capital, but the capital owners in the foreign country are seeing their return on capital decline, so they end up worse off. Right? So there are distributional considerations, but in what we're just more broadly, more generally showing here is that overall, there are global gains from immigration and from FDI that's reflected in an increase in total output value.